we're starting this call here. Uh, this is for uh, reddit.com slash r slash longevity, which is a kind of a niche subreddit with longevity enthusiasts. And um, it's gonna be posted there probably tomorrow. Uh, and we're here joined by Dr. Greg Fahey, who has just uh, started or finished a thymus rejuvenation project, or there, there's some progress going on over there. And I'll uh, let you talk a little bit about yourself and um, what, you're, what you're doing right now. Sure, Aaron. So hello, everybody. So I'm Greg Fay, and um, I actually do two different kinds of things. I, uh, I preserve organs at cryogenic temperatures, and I also attack the human aging process. And the uh, way that we did the uh, latter uh, is to attempt to regrow an organ in your chest cavity called the thymus, which is responsible for controlling your immune system. And unfortunately, the thymus begins to wither and die when we go through puberty. And that process continues throughout life. And eventually, it has an effect on your immune system. And we think that that has an effect on your age-related mortality and morbidity as well as on your aging more, more globally. So we tried to regrow the thymus using a combination of agents that are already available. These are not new drugs that, that will take uh, 20 years to come onto the market. These things are already available. And uh, what we found is that in the process of reversing the aging of the thymus, this master gland of your immune system, we also saw other signs of aging reversal in other tissues, such as hair turning dark again, or kidneys uh, improving their function over time. And when we uh, collaborated with Steve Horvath at UCLA to apply his uh, DNA methylation clock of aging to evaluate our guys before and after treatment, his clock said that they were biologically one and a half years younger after a year of treatment than they were when they began the treatment which means that we not only reversed an, a one year period of, of uh, time, you know, aging over time, which is how long the trial took, it took one year, but then beyond that, we reversed aging by another one and a half years. Now, when I say that, I have to be a little careful because uh, it's a shorthand to say we reversed aging. What we reversed were several genetic markers of aging, uh, epigenetic markers of aging, uh, and aging as a whole is more broad than that, more complicated than that. So for example, we did not reverse telomer aging, but we did reverse uh, aspects of aging that correlate with how long you're going to live and whether you're gonna get sick in the future or not. So uh, that was a pretty big step and we're now moving to reproduce that step and hopefully maybe even do a bit better. Awesome. Um... So Dr. Fahey has background in uh, vitrification and cryonics as well as thymus regeneration. Um, we're getting some more people joining here. Oh, and there's a plane going overhead. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a bunch of questions. Uh, some of them are from the forum and then um, some are from going to be from live audience. But I'll start with one that uh, I've wanted to ask you, um, and it's great to have you here. Uh, so I don't know the history of frozen blood, and I was wondering, there's an idea that uh, I had a while ago, which is, it's not a complicated idea. Basically what you do is you take your blood, you donate it, you store it, you freeze it, you can separate it like into red blood cells and then the, the plasma fraction. You freeze it for like 20 years, and then you put it back into your own body um, to cycle out what will then be your old blood with your own, with your own preserved blood. And uh, it seems like a really simple idea and it's based on stuff that we can do right now. And I don't, I can't find any information about anybody else who's tried it, but it's so simple. I'm, I'm sure that there must've been a reason. And I don't know of the, like, I'm too young to know like what happened with blood freezing that whole story arc. And I was wondering if you knew uh, something about that. Sure, so uh, you're right. It's a simple idea. It makes a lot of sense. I think it's a valid idea. It was proposed by Theodore uh, McNoden about 50 years ago. And uh, it was pretty much ignored by everybody ever since. Uh, and maybe one reason it was ignored is that 
if people made measurements of immune system uh, competence over time, they just didn't find much. So the thymus withers away and everything. But uh, if you measure T cell function, it's still pretty good up to the age of 60 or so. And so I think maybe people didn't quite take this as seriously as they should have. More recently, people have measured T cell function at greater ages. And after about the age of 62 or so, then you start to see a precipitous drop in the competence of the T cells that you have left over from when you were a teenager, and when, when you were a 30 year old, and you were still making some new T cells. Uh, and so I think we're now more aware of the importance of immune system aging than we have been historically. Uh, but unfortunately, all those decades have gone by and very few people have banked their young T cells for use uh, later on in life. There have been some people who've been interested in that. Uh, I hear about efforts occasionally, but I'm not aware of any large scale effort in which that's been done. Uh, since I run a cryobiology company, Theoretically, we could provide that as a service to people. We looked into the economics of it, and at the time it wasn't really compelling. We would about break even on the effort, so we didn't do anything about it. But uh, if large numbers of people wanted to store their T cells when they were 20 and then have them put back in when they're 60, uh, then that could become a big business and might benefit a lot of people. But of course, what I think is a better idea still or at least an, an additional idea that would go along with that would be to restore the function of the thymus that is missing in the first place that causes the problems in the first place. So if you can regrow your thymus and make new T cells, that may be just as good as or better than trying to store them from, from an earlier time. For one thing, then you'll be producing those T cells for a long period of time in sufficient quantity to repopulate your body. Whereas if you just take a, a small blood sample at one point in time and preserve the, the white cells in that sample, you may or may not be getting enough white cells to make a, a difference. So um, I think uh, if you wanted to hedge your bets, you do it both ways. But one, what, one thing I think you do not want to do is just do the T cell banking and not do the thymus regeneration because the thymus regeneration aspect has additional benefits. Uh, for example, if you transplant an old thymus into a, I mean a young thymus into an old animal, the liver seems to get younger and the brain seems to get younger and the salivary glands seem to get younger. So uh, there may be benefits beyond just restoring immune system function. But it's a great idea. You're absolutely right. If people were really concerned about their own aging, they should have done this 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, Takes time uh, for these things to catch on. Yeah. Um, has there ever, has there ever been anybody who's tried to, store their blood like wholesale not just for the stem cells or for the, the t cells but for the actual like like just the entire blood like if you're like suppose it's like an oil change or something right mm -hmm. so you, you donate five liters of blood which is about how much you have in your in your body and then you wait 20 years and you cycle out all of your blood so you like get rid you know you're putting in the new blood and you're pulling out the old blood which is potentially got detritus or something built up in it Nobody's, has anybody um, tried to do that or something similar to that? Well, not really. Um, so there have been some interesting experiments done recently that are sort of indirectly related to that, that indicate that that kind of heroic intervention is probably not necessary. Uh, and that, that was done by Irina Convoy's lab in which uh, she sat people in a, 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 uh, an apheresis uh, chair so uh, phoresis is a process by which they stick a needle in one arm, they take your blood out, they spin down the cells to separate the cells from the plasma, and then they put the cells back in, and then they usually would use that machine to uh, donate plasma to somebody else who needs it. But in this case, what Irina's group did uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, a local um, uh, uh, MD uh, was to take out half of the plasma uh, of animals at least and put back in just a simple salt solution with some albumin added and uh, that rejuvenated the animals and preliminary evidence in humans suggests that maybe that sort of thing will be observed in humans as well although no formal trial has been done yet and uh, I heard that she was recruiting for a trial I have not heard about any follow-through on that but uh, if you're worried about 
old things building up in your bloodstream, it may be sufficient just to replace half of your plasma, which would be more like a liter and a half or something. So if you have five liters of blood and half of that is red cells, you know, two and a half liters of red cells, uh, and you take half of what's left over, that's only a liter and a quarter, liter and a half of plasma, replace that with sodium chloride and a little albumin. Uh, that's a pretty simple, harmless, safe procedure. Uh, and if it leads to a lot of, uh, you know, beneficial effects with respect to aging, then it, it would be probably infinitely more practical than trying to freeze all components of your blood and then reconstitute them. So one thing about, you know, that latter thing is that in cryobiology, we learn that uh, every different kind of cell needs a different freezing technique. And since blood contains all kinds of different cells, you have to separate out the components, freeze them, and then put them back together again. That gets very complicated and very expensive. And in fact, there's not a, there's not a good rationale for it because most things are pretty stable over, over the aging process. The main thing that goes down is your T cells. So, um, you know, I'm not to say that there are no other changes. There, there are, but the, but the rationale for replacing all of your blood with young blood is probably not really there. But if you just replace the plasma, you probably get a, an even better effect. So that would be the, the smarter way to go. That makes but sense. it's a very creative idea. Good, good thinking. Keep thinking. Um, okay, so we have a question. I'll just start with some here. In your trim trial, uh, methylation age was measured only in blood. Is there any intention of measuring methylation age in other tissue types uh, in trim MX? Yes, uh, so TrimX, the extension of, uh, of the trim trial, we will be looking at uh, cheek cells as well, so blood and buccal swabs. Uh, and that's not everything that we might wish for, but obviously I think twice before I stick a needle in somebody's liver or something like that, you know, we're still at early stages of this and uh, there's a limit on what you can reasonably do to, to volunteers. Uh, but we can certainly have them swab the inside of their cheeks, and then the, the lining of the, of the cheeks provides an independent measure of uh, biological age or epigenetic age. So we're definitely going to be doing that. We've contemplated possibly at some point getting um, skin biopsies and subcutaneous fat biopsies. Those might be feasible, but it's complicated enough running these trials with COVID going on and everything else like right uh, like that right now, that we have not attempted to do that. Uh, however, there is another clock that we've added in, which is the uh, plasma phenoage clock. So we're able to calculate biological age based on things that are in your bloodstream uh, that can be readily measured. And um, we went back and we did a retrospective analysis of the trim data, and we found that uh, that measure of aging rejuvenated as well in our trial. So we had four different epigenetic clocks, which work in slightly different ways, all showing that uh, we had rejuvenated our guys. And then uh, the plasma clock also showed uh, the same kind of result with similar magnitude, about two and a half years. So we were pretty pleased about that because that's, a, a, again, a very independent measure of, of biological aging. Uh, but there is a limit and we'll, we'll have to sort of be somewhat constrained, uh, but I think at least the cheek cells will be helpful. All right. Um, let's see. Here's a question about uh, the wood frog. This frog can survive being frozen for months, and when it thaws, its heart restarts and it hops away. Are there any studies going on oh. involving this frog and its mechanism for use in cryonics and bringing back frozen people? Well, so we have to make a couple of distinctions here. Uh, yeah, right. So cryonics is freezing people or, or vitrifying people. And cryobiology is studying what happens when you try to freeze or, or vitrify various things. And cryobiology is actually a lot broader than that. It includes what happens when things just get cold also. Uh, hypothermia is part of cryobiology. So I'm a cryobiologist. Uh, I don't do cryonics. Uh, but uh, you know what I do is quite relevant to cryonics, right? So the the wood frog doesn't know about any of this uh, these distinctions. It just freezes under natural conditions, 
And after a couple of weeks, when it gets warmer, the frog does in fact thaw out and uh, the heart resumes beating spontaneously and it goes hopping away. So this has been studied uh, by a number of laboratories and uh, the most famous of these laboratories is the one of uh, Ken Story in uh, Canada. Uh, and they have looked at uh, the biochemistry by which the frogs do this and other factors. But uh, I think the biggest take home message uh, for us right now is that when these frogs freeze, they don't exactly freeze. So um, they are very small. And when ice forms in their skin, it triggers a neuronal response that causes the frogs to start making a lot of glucose, which acts as a cryoprotective agent. And uh, on top of that, uh, ice crystallization in the skin raises the local temperature. So when ice, when water is cooled below its freezing point and then it freezes, the temperature actually comes back up to the freezing point of the ice. And uh, it then, so the process of converting water into ice involves a uh, release of a tremendous amount of heat. So that can keep the frogs warm, quote unquote, while they're freezing for quite a long time. And what that does is it gives lots of time for water to move from the internal organs in the frog to those superficial ice crystals. And so what you see if you cut open a frog in the middle of the process of freezing is that its heart and its lungs and its liver and its brain actually shrink because the water in the brain is volatilizing essentially and going uh, into the tissues. So you see a lot of ice building up in the skin and, and not that much ice actually invading the major organs. And you see the same thing in certain um, uh, plants that survive freezing in nature. Uh, they contain a membrane that allows ice to form on one side but not the other. And ice forms on, on this uh, sacrificial part of the plant and then water goes to the ice and expands the ice in that uh, safe zone and just shrinks the sensitive part of the plant, just like happens in the frog. So what the frog is teaching me, at least, is that I'm on the right track trying to avoid ice formation, because if I want to preserve a kidney, for example, uh, there's no safe place I can put the ice. Uh, the, the human kidney is 250 grams. A wood frog is maybe five grams or 10 grams or something like that. So uh, you just can't play the same trick but I can accomplish the same result by preventing ice from forming at any temperature, no matter how low you go in temperature, by replacing a lot of water with things that prevent the water from freezing. So it's like putting antifreeze in your car radiator in the winter time. Uh, if you put in enough antifreeze, then the, the car will not have a frozen radiator, even if it gets very, very cold. So we just take that idea to its logical extreme such that you could take a human organ, for example, down to absolute zero and it still would not form any ice. So that's the way we think we're gonna solve the problem. And uh, we've actually begun, so we, we showed many years ago that we could uh, remove a rabbit kidney, uh, take it uh, far below zero, uh, below the glass transition temperature to, to make it a glassy kidney. And that's what happens if, if water it cools far enough, uh, you know, Temperature is a measure of internal energy. So as you lower the temperature, the amount of energy in the system goes way down. And eventually something has to happen. And so if it's not gonna be ice formation, it has to be something else. And what that is, is vitrification, which is glass formation. So what that means is that the system just locks up as a, as a um, like a snapshot of a liquid state, you might say. Everything just stops moving because right. there's no energy to drive molecular motion. So we, we did that in rabbit kidney, uh, put the rabbit kidney back into an animal and, it, and the animal survived for 48 days until we decided to take the kidney out and have a look at it. And although the kidney supported life, it had some ice damage. So we've been trying to eliminate that. And we think we know how to do that now. And so we've begun doing those experiments again. And I anticipate that hopefully this year we'll get a lot more vitrified uh, survivors uh, with a better quality result than we, when we got when we did the experiment in the first place. So that's kind of a one way of answering your question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a definitely an answer. That's really cool. Um, so you guys are following up with the rabbit. You're doing more with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We absolutely are. We actually did another one of these transplants last year, at the end of last year, and I think the rabbit would have survived, but um, 
they they develop a transient form of anemia and they have to get blood transfusions and uh I had to let people go home for Christmas, so we couldn't really transfuse the rabbit over Christmas that much. So we, uh, we took the kidney out and had a look at it. It actually looked pretty good. Uh, but we're gonna be doing a lot more of those this, this year. All right, awesome. Um, we have a question from a person in the, in the chat. Um, is Intervene Immune still looking to raise funds from investors and or donations? And then related to that, is Trim MX fully funded and how is enrollment proceeding in the extension? So um, the first uh, question has a couple of different answers. So yes, we are still seeking investment, but we're not seeking it that actively right now. So um, if, if people sort of see the light and they wanna get in uh, at the ground floor level, uh, we welcome that. And we have raised some money that way, which we greatly appreciate. It's allowed us to get to where we are now, which is the onset of this clinical trial. But um, we realized after a while that we're in a very unique position with respect to uh, raising money. And that position has to do with the unusual stance of the FDA toward growth hormone. So growth hormone is one of the mainstays of our treatment uh, modality. And it's the only drug in the in US FDA armamentarium that is not allowed to be prescribed off label. So any other drug, you know, once it's approved for one thing, you can use it for anything else that may be appropriate. But growth hormone, they don't like that. They don't like you to use it particularly for anti-aging or for athletics or cosmetics or anything like that. And so we are kind of in a pickle um, uh, with respect to that. Otherwise, we could just market our treatment right now, but we, we can't really do that because we can't prescribe growth hormone off-label. Right now, we don't have an FDA uh, approved indication for growth hormone. So we have to have a conversation with the FDA to find out what they need, what they will be satisfied by, what we need to shoot for to get them to approve our treatment. And uh, if they come back to us with something we can do, then we will have a story to tell because then we can go to an investor and say, look, the FDA says that as long as we can show improvement in kidney function, you know, we can get this prescribed uh, uh, to treat age-related kidney dysfunction, you know, to prevent age-related kidney dysfunction, which we could show, you know, in a snap because we proved that statistically with nine people in the CRIM trial. You know, so usually to get FDA approval, you have to have thousands and thousands of people and go through all kinds of testing that we don't have to go through because the toxicity profile of these drugs is already known. It's not a mystery. We know these things are safe. Uh, and uh, all we have to do is just show that they can do things in combination that haven't been doable before. And if the FDA buys that, then we have a story to tell. Then we can say to an investor, look, if you give us this amount of money, we know how much it's going to cost to hit this FDA target. We can get uh, approved in this amount of time. And therefore, you'll get your payout, you know, with pretty good assurance, uh, much faster than you could get it with any other investment in aging, just, you know, almost. But we don't have that conversation completed yet. So we need, we're, we're in the process of setting up that, that conversation. But in spite of that, people have come forward. They have contributed to us. We have a safe investment mechanism right now, SAFE. And if anybody's interested, we uh, can provide them with more information than they might even want. Uh, in support of, of that investment. But right now, to answer your other question, we really don't have uh, any funding for the TRIMX trial. So TRIM, we were able to fund with an angel investment that, that's launched the company, but with TRIMX, we haven't accomplished that so far. So what we're forced to do is um, have people cover their own costs in TRIMX. And uh, that has been successful and we began to uh, enroll our first uh, group of individuals in Thanksgiving week, so near the end of uh, November in the United States. And uh, uh, we've uh, enrolled a new cohort ever, uh, ever since that one, one per month. Uh, so we've, we've enrolled in uh, uh, November, uh, December, and January. And actually, uh, I might as well mention this, uh, I'm part of the third cohort, so uh, I'm signing up for my, my own treatment, right? Because I'm not getting any younger either, you know, and I can't wait forever on these things. And I've been developing this thing. I really wanted to be part of the trim uh, treatment, but my uh, associate uh, 
Robert Brooke, who's our CEO, thought it would look kind of funny if, uh, if the chief scientific officer were part of the study group. So we didn't do that, uh, but we're doing it this time around because uh, I just can't wait any longer. Uh, and uh, actually two of the guys who were in the original TRIM trial are also signing up in TRIM X and they're actually by coincidence in the same cohort as myself, the January cohort. So uh, it should be really interesting to see what happens if you regenerate the thymus twice uh, and whether we can reverse epigenetic aging twice and whether the uh, reduced epigenetic age that we measured back in like 2017 or whenever it was is still there. And you know we can roll back uh, biological aging even farther. So uh, these guys are gonna be really, really interesting to follow. Uh, and we may get some other uh, previous trim people involved at some point as well. I know there's interest on, on the part of a number of them. Uh, and uh, sometimes people ask me if we've done follow-up studies on the original trim cohort to see how they're doing. We really haven't done that, but uh, all I can say is that we haven't heard anything bad happening. And uh, most of the people who are in the trial are still very uh, positive and enthusiastic about it. So um, all that's a good sign. On that note, we have a, another question from uh, the forum, which is, do you, have you noticed any um, negative side effects or to any degree, uh, even small ones? Yeah, sure. So uh, growth hormone does have side effects, right? And we knew that. And when you do a trial like this, you have to inform the people who are signing up uh, through this process called informed consent of everything that might bother them during the course of the trial, and so we do. So one of the things that growth hormone does is a little bit paradoxical, but it, in some people it can cause fluid retention. Uh, some people it can cause carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, which you probably know about. You know, if you, if you do a lot of typing on your keyboard, on your computer, your forearm can feel bad and that gets worse, you know, if you're on growth hormone in some people. Uh, growth hormone tends to regrow the cartilage in your joints, and that makes your joints hurt, so it feels like arthritis. And I'm hoping it's actually a good thing in disguise, but sometimes that can be a problem. Um, there are other side effects that uh, have not been reported that much and uh, uh, are not necessarily bad, but one guy uh, in the TRIM trial loved to run up the mountains of uh, San Francisco or the, the hills of San Francisco, if anyone has seen the San Francisco, we have some pretty steep hills there. And this guy just loved to run up those things. And after a while, he got a sore rear end doing that. So, uh, you know, that was his side effect. Uh, we call that myalgia or sore muscles. Uh, another guy um, just felt euphoric uh, for a while. Uh, another guy felt, you know, that he suddenly had this deep appreciation of music, you know. Uh, Another guy uh, had this problem before he entered the trial, which he didn't tell us about, bradycardia. His heart was very slow. And uh, he had um, a family history that would actually not have allowed him to enter the trial if we'd known about it. But so he snuck himself into the trial. And um, every time he injected himself with a growth hormone, I think it made him nervous and his bradycardia actually got worse, paradoxically. So uh, he had to leave. And I don't know if that it's a real effect of our treatment or if that's all psychological, but that was another thing that could be a side effect. So these are all minor things and uh, we were able to manage these things satisfactorily during the, uh, the trim trial. Nobody dropped out as a result of any of these side effects. Oh, gynecomastia is another one. You, if you're a guy, your breasts can get a little bit bigger. One guy uh, in the trial reported that, but no way was he gonna drop out of the trial for that because it also, increased his libido and made him feel great, you know, so it was worth it to him, right? So, um, yeah, so there are side effects, everything has side effects, um, but they just weren't serious compared to the uh, expected benefits. So uh, I think that that'll continue to be true in, in TRIMX, and we actually are hoping to uh, even improve in that regard in some ways in TRIMX as well, although you'll have to see if that works out. But it's awesome. a good question. It's a very good question. But at the same time, I want to say something else, because this may give a false impression. I don't want anybody to run out and try to do this on your own, okay? And 
you know, this is really hammered home to me when we started enrolling people for Trim X because, you know, humans are like the population of a zoo, right? We're all so different, right? No two people are alike. And some people have medical conditions that really make you think twice, you know, about what would happen if you go on this regimen. So one of the things that we're really uh, keen on is avoiding any cancer risk. And some of the people have things like inflammatory bowel disease and whatnot, which might lead to cancer if, you know, you further inflame it, you know? So you have to be really, really careful about things like that. There's also one guy in the CRIM trial that I would have not let in if I'd known, you know, his history better, but we let him stay in and he was peculiar in several ways, but he, he did okay in, in, in general. But near the end of the trial, his white cell population started doing goofy things. Uh, you know, he was really low in white cells at the beginning of the trial and and, and, and everything was going well through nine months or so, but at 12 months, his white cell population just shot right up. And we were alarmed and he even thought, well, geez, what, do I have leukemia or something like that? So we tracked him uh, after the end of the trial several times and everything settled down. And I think he ended up better off than he was before the trial, but it was really scary. And uh, so if you're just some Joe Schmo out there and you're doing this on your own and you're not monitoring yourself and you don't know what to look for, and you don't know medicine and you don't know how to uh, think through various paradoxes that might arise in your own treatment, you can get into trouble. I think that you can probably get into trouble. And so um, I don't think that you should be trying this on your own. Uh, it's just so complicated. There's so much to it. It seems really simple. Oh, I'll just take these three meds, but how do you take them? And when do you take them? And uh, how do you monitor whether they're working and how do you monitor whether you're getting into trouble or not? And, you know, we spent a lot of money in this trial monitoring people for safety, not just efficacy, but safety. And, you know, are you going to do all those things on your own? Would you even know how to do those things on your own? Probably not. So at this point, so eventually we're going to get to the point where you can go to your doctor and say, hey, doc, I need a I need a recharge of my thymus, please. And they'll say, okay, you know, we'll put you on the, uh, you know, trim uh, uh, treatment for a year and, uh, you know, we'll follow, follow you, you know, do a couple tests here and there. But since we know it's completely safe, we won't, won't have to monitor you that closely. Um, and by that time, we'll have cheaper meds also and everything will be fine. But unfortunately, we're not there yet. So for people who are ridiculously young, like you and Christine here, uh, you can wait a while. You don't have to rush into this. And I, that's what I recommend most people do. Uh, wait for this to be debugged and, uh, and proven out uh, and made more easy and, uh, and uh, more turnkey. And, uh, and I think you'll do fine. Oh, I'm losing your audio. I think you need to unmute yourself. No, no, no I, was, I was muted. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm gonna do one more question from an uh, outside source and then we'll open it up to people who are here but who don't have their video turned on to start asking okay. questions. Uh, the last one is, um, I was told to ask you about advances over the Alcor methods uh, circa 2010 and whether there are any interesting near future experiments on mammals. Wait, uh, sorry, uh -huh. there's a, yeah, but you already mentioned the, the rabbits, but. Anything, anything about Alcor that you can? Uh... Yeah. yeah, I think. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah I, Sorry. I, I think so. So, um, so we did a lot of experiments um, that at some point may be applicable to what Alcor does. So we were interested in, uh, in what they call stabilization, right? So uh, there's always a process. Uh, I'm sorry if that's picking up in the background. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so you got to get from point A to point B, right? So if you're in a hospital in California, you have to get to Phoenix somehow, right? And, and bad things can happen during that time. So we looked into that and what effect that might have in uh, a whole animal model, a couple of different whole animal models actually, and came up with uh, solutions uh, and techniques that might 
give better outcomes after that kind of uh, delay. And uh, we also look at um, what happens if your heart stops for a while before you, you get uh, uh, processed and came up with some approaches to, to mitigating damage from that cause. So these are things that are kind of on, in the pipeline on their way into clinical use. I think the other thing that's more imminent and will probably happen very quickly is liquid ventilation or partial liquid ventilation, also referred to as mixed mode liquid ventilation. So the problem uh, in many contexts, not just in Alcor's context, but in many contexts is um, that people have heart attacks. And uh, sometimes, you know, they may have heart attack while they're watching TV in their front uh, room or something like that. And uh, the ambulance gets there, let's say six minutes later, and we know that uh, if you don't start CPR within five minutes, your brain is gonna get fried, at least to some extent. But, uh, uh, so I, I work for a company called 21st Century Medicine, in addition to Intervene Immune. 21st Century Medicine has a sister company, Critical Care Research. And I did some collaborative research with them beginning at the end of the last century uh, to show that you could uh, basically kill a dog. You, you, you stop the heartbeat of the dog at normal body temperature and you let it sit there dead for 16 minutes. And then you cool the dog very quickly because you've, you've uh, cleverly installed some tubing in the major blood vessels in the dog before you uh, stop its heart. It allows you to now uh, perfuse cool it down to 34 degrees. So you rapidly cool it to 34 degrees. You hold it there for anywhere from six to 24 hours. And then you wake the dog back up having restarted its heart. And what happens is the dog comes back, it survives and it's got all of its marbles. It hasn't, there's no brain damage. So the idea that the brain dies after five minutes is completely wrong. What happens after five minutes is that if you just restart the heart, uh, the brain swells and uh, that prevents the brain from getting uh, nutrients and so forth and it can't do its housekeeping and it just goes downhill and, and that's a terminal situation. But the brain has the ability to repair itself. It just needs to be given a chance. And so if you cool the brain to 34, then uh, the mental functions are uh, toned down and that leaves energy available to do the repair work that the brain has to do to repair even 16 minutes of cardiac arrest. So uh, if this could be done in uh, clinical medicine as a routine, then a lot of people could be saved after having heart attacks that currently end up as vegetables or die. Uh, so the problem is that since you don't know in advance if somebody's gonna have cardiac arrest, you can't go into the living room with a guy while he's watching Bonanza or whatever and stick tubes into his major vessel you know, just before he has a heart attack so that you can cool him rapidly. So you have to have some other way to do it. So what critical care research came up with is, is a very clever idea. And uh, it turns out, of course, that uh, every time your heart beats, what it does is it pushes your blood through your lungs and then to the rest of your body. So all of the blood in your body goes through your lungs. That means if you could cool your lungs and maintain circulation through the lungs, you could cool the whole body very quickly uh, non-invasively, you wouldn't need any tube in a major blood vessel. You just need to slide a, a, a tube down the guy's throat into the lungs and lavage it with something that's gonna cool the lungs off. So after a great deal of work uh, at Critical Care Research, they came up with fluorocarbon mixtures that uh, could cool the dogs very quickly, like one degree a minute. Uh, so in three minutes, you know, you're out of the zone in which you're gonna die and down to the zone in which you're gonna recover with no brain damage, right? So not only would this be a boon to clinical medicine, but it would certainly be a boon for people who are interested in alcohol, right? Because uh, as soon as they get to you, I mean, so a lot of times alcohol standby teams could be in the next room at a hospital, you know, when, you're, when you suffer cardiac arrest. So uh, if they bring their partial liquid ventilation system in and just start on you right away, and they put a thumper on your chest to circulate blood through your non-beating heart, they can start cooling you instantly. Okay, so now we're talking about being able to preserve people with viable brains, right, at the time they're preserved. And, and nobody's going to require brain death because in those circumstances, you're not a brain donor. I mean, you're not a, a, an organ donor. 
So the hospitals don't have to worry about brain death. They know that you just quote unquote died because your heart stopped, right? Uh, but that, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your brain. Your brain may be in mint condition. So uh, this is a major advance. So we started doing some collaborative work with critical care research to try this. So what they did in their original dog work was with heart beating dogs. They would take the dog with the full force of the normal circulation and do liquid ventilation on the dogs and they got this one degree per minute cooling rate. But in a, uh, an Alcor related uh, a situation or in a cardiac arrest situation in normal medicine, the heart's not beating. So what happens if, if uh, you, know, uh, you put a thumper on, do you get enough cooling to make it worthwhile? So it looks like from what we found out that uh, you can, you can get decent amount of cooling that way. And so we decided just last week that we've done enough experiments like that to prove the principle in an animal model. And there's no reason to do any more animal studies. It's now time to try it on people. So uh, we're, we're hoping to hand that uh, technology over to Alcor and let them see what they can do with it. So that's, uh, that's a new development that may have a, a, a major impact on the quality of preservation going forward. So we'll, we'll be hopeful about that. Well, that is super cool. And I didn't, had no idea that you guys were at that point, at this point uh, in time. So that's very interesting. Um, okay, so we're gonna come, we're gonna bring it back to anybody who wants to ask a question directly in person. Uh, I think Daniel posted one, but um, do you have a, do you guys have microphones and whatnot? You may have to yeah, unmute yeah. yourself, okay. Um, hi, Greg. Nice to meet you. Um, I wanted to, to ask a couple of questions. Um, sure. Why do you think um, the, thymus, um, the thymus restoration uh, like uh, reduce the epigenetic age? Is it just the thymus um, restoration or something in addition to that in, in the trial? Uh, it's 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 probably partly thymic uh, regeneration and partly something else. So we think that the epigenetic age reversal is a side effect of our treatment. It was an unpredictable side effect of our treatment, and it's 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 not even predictable uh, knowing that the thymus has other influences on aging, uh, because uh, we were able to correlate the degree of thymic regeneration with improvements in immune system function but we were not able to correlate uh, improvements in thymic uh, uh, regeneration uh, with epigenetic aging reversal. Now, there's still a little bit of massaging of the data I'd like to attempt to see if we can find a correlation that we may have missed before, but um, essentially, you know, the thing about the epigenetic age uh, clocks is that they actually are not, most of them are not very sensitive to the composition of your blood, so even if you have more naive T cells versus fewer naive T cells, it doesn't really change your epigenetic age that much. Uh, the epigenetic age is, is measuring something much deeper. And, uh, and the same clock applies through uh, all of the tissues in the body. And, um, and, this, and, and a very similar clock now has been shown to apply to every animal that there is, that we know, at least every mammal. So Steve Horvath just published a, a paper in which he's able to tell you how old you are if you're a chinchilla or a raccoon or a human or a mouse, uh, all using the same epigenetic aging clock. So that's pretty darn interesting. And, and, it, and so it, it's more than just the immune system. It, it's a generalized um, process that it seems to be common to all mammals. And of course, uh, mammals age with some differences, but there's obviously some underlying mechanism that's driving it all. And it's not just immune in nature, uh, although I do think immune is part of it. So we've uh, kind of stumbled upon something really deep and something really interesting and something that really is informative and also something that is very surprising because it goes against the grain of much thought in the field of aging research, which is that IGF-1 is a driver of aging. And what we're suggesting is maybe it's not, or maybe in the right context, it's not. Maybe it's a driver of aging in some ways in isolation, but in the context that we're creating, in which we're creating a more youthful 
environment in a sense in combination with an increase in IGF-1, then the balance changes to aging reversal. So we're just beginning to go down this road. There's a lot we don't understand, uh, but it's, it's very interesting. And so we can at least partially answer your question. It's not just the thymus, there's something else going on. And what I'd like to do is to be able to start collaborating with some biochemical laboratories so we can dig into the mechanisms a bit deep, more deeply. And I, can, I, can I follow up? Sure. Um, um, what, do you, what do you think in, in this context, obviously, what do you think about David Sinclair's um, theory of, um, of aging as basically as driven by um, epigenetic changes? And also, how do you think um, the discovery that you stumbled upon, how do you think it relates to, to the epigen epigenetic reprogramming and what do you think is the most promising potential approach here? Right, so uh, this is a really uh, interesting set of questions. So I think, uh, you know, I have total admiration and respect for David Sinclair and he works uh, at Harvard and I work out of my house. So, you know, I'd be a little bit impudent to say that I disagree with him, but I disagree with him, okay? So that's just the way it is. Uh, so David, um, he uh, has uncovered something really interesting, uh, which you were asking about the end of your question about NAD. And we proposed in our paper that what he discovered is actually one of the mechanisms by which we reversed aging or seem to reverse aging in our study. Because what we did is to lower monocyte levels and since uh, our paper came out, there's been more uh, evidence that monocyte uh, recruitment by senescent cells in fat in particular, but also elsewhere in the body, it actually drives down tissue levels of NAD. And when you drive down tissue levels of NAD, uh, mitochondria age, blood vessels age, all kinds of things age. And when you restore NAD, all those age-related changes are reversed. So Sinclair's lab first showed that in 2013 in a landmark paper, which I think will change the future of, of aging uh, in, in many ways, and it's still beginning to, un, you know, continuing to unfold. Uh, so we, we did that automatically, you know, not by, you know, ingesting something that could be made into NAD, but by lowering the monocyte populations that caused the problem in the first place. So the reason that tissue NAD levels go down with age is because monocytes cause it to go down. It's very bizarre because the monocytes have this ectoenzyme, uh, CD38, which destroys NAD. And you might think that that would have no effect on tissues because it's outside the cell, but it does and it drives down the NAD level. And that's why we have our NAD levels go down and that may be why we age to a large extent. Now, I'm sure there are other mechanisms, but that's part of it. Now, NAD is related to sirtuins, and sirtuins are related to DNA repair, and DNA repair is related to methylation, and all these things are related. Uh, and, and David Sinclair did this amazing experiment on yeast many years ago, which suggested that aging is caused by uh, epigenetic confusion, that if you don't have your sirtuins up to full blast, that uh, you're not maintaining the methylation state, and when you uh, recover from an insult and you go back uh, uh, to having normal sirtuins around, they don't totally reverse the chaos that was introduced into the methylome. Uh, and, that, and that it's this chaos in the methylome over time that actually causes aging. And he was able to reverse parts of that, but uh, uh, he still doesn't really say in his book, even though his book title says, you don't have to age. The book actually doesn't tell you that you don't have to age the book will lead you to think that actually uh, you will age because chaos is chaos and can't be reversed. Although actually we, we do know that it can be reversed by epigenetic reprogramming techniques. Uh, so to try to, uh, you know, come to the focus here, um, I think that uh, the fact that Horvath's clock measures aging in all animals through changes in methylation essentially to me confirms a huge body of evidence, which I've amassed and summarized in my book in, in 2010. Uh, 
and others have as well, uh, that aging is actually biologically controlled. It's not chaos. There's, it's an extension of development. And uh, we can, you know, wonder about where it comes from and how it works and all that kind of stuff, but it's organized, it's not chaotic. And that's the only reason that it's possible to reverse epigenetic aging. Because if I throw anything into a bunch of chaos, I'm probably just gonna end up with more chaos in general. But, uh, but that's not what happened. It was reversible and I think it's reversible because the mechanisms that drive it can be reversed because those mechanisms exist. Those mechanisms are organized orderly mechanisms. Uh, so that's my theory. We will see over time uh, to, to what extent that, that proves to be true. Uh, but uh, I think that David is on track with trying to restore NAD levels. I think we're on track with trying to do it biologically because I think that's a, going to be a much more powerful approach. Um, and, but I, I disagree that it's just chaos. I think, I think something interesting, much more interesting than chaos is going on. You know, because you know, aging causes us to uh, have changes that don't look good, we think of chaos and we think of disorder. We think of the second law of thermodynamics and all of that. But um, biology is so all about you know, avoiding the second law of thermodynamics. We wouldn't be sitting here if the second law of thermodynamics could defeat biology. So you know, we have whales that live to 210 years and they have bigger brains than we do and they're just as warm as we are. Uh, maybe they live in cold water, so their skin is cold, but their bodies are, are warm just like ours. So um, uh, aging is whatever the body wants it to be, I think. And so we just have to change the body's opinion about what age it wants to be. And what about like Yamanaka, the use of Yamanaka yeah. factors? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely, absolutely. So that's, that's, that's the um, premier example of epigenetic aging uh, reprogramming that we have right now. And, and it's, it's barking up the same tree that I was just talking about. In other words, uh, it's recognizing the fact that as we go through our developmental program and we become adults and we get older, it's a progression of organized, orderly you know, changes within reason. I mean, there's all kinds of uh, extra stuff I could, you know, bring in here, but, but the, the main thrust here is that it's an organized pr uh, process. And uh, because of that, uh, if you expose cells to Yamanaka factors, you begin to go back to an embryonic state, but you don't just leapfrog over all the intermediate states. You actually recapitulate the intermediate states to some degree as you get there. And because of that, you can reactivate Yamanaka factors in a whole mouse and show signs of rejuvenation. And it's because, it's ultimately because methylation is related to gene expression and gene expression is what changes that causes aging. And so you can change gene expression with the Yamanaka factor, you can change gene expression with the trim protocol and, uh, and you can change gene expression in other ways too, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, what the, the take home message as so we're beginning to get our hands on the levers that control aging, the, the genetics of aging, the genetic process and unfolding of aging. That's tremendously exciting, tremendously revolutionary. It's going to change the future of life on this planet. I mean, we will not, you know, the aging we experience five or 10 years from now is not, not gonna be your grandfather's aging anymore. So you're optimistic for people even your age yeah, 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 I am. Yeah, I am. So, you know, that's, that's another question, you know, is, for example, uh, is there a, an age limit? You know, beyond a certain point, you may be so torn down by the aging process that you can't come back. Well, it's possible that's true. It's possible that's not true. We just don't know at this point. And if there is a limit, we don't know what it is. So with respect to the thymus, which I can say something about, um, the original demonstration that thymic aging was reversible uh, was made in 1986 and it was a rat model. And they intervened in thymic aging at two different ages. And in one case, they intervened after the mean lifespan of that particular type of rat. And they could still partially, but not fully regenerate the thymus and partially, but not fully restore uh, immune system function. And so if we uh, take uh, the age of 78, for example, to be the mean lifespan for humans in the United States, 
Uh, I'm younger than that, so I still think I have a shot at regenerating my own thymus. So we will see. We will see. Thanks so much. You're it was welcome. A pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure too. Thank you. Very good questions, by the way. Very educated questions. Uh, we have another question from someone who can't turn on their microphone right now, though. Um, they want to ask, can, how can machine learning help in cryobiology? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Nobody ever asked that question. Um, so here's, here's the beginning of an answer. So we have started um, experiments in which we take a, a kidney out and drop it in liquid nitrogen. And then we'll you know, perfuse it with cryoprotective agents and then wash out the cryoprotective agents and take that kidney and drop it in liquid nitrogen. And then we'll take the kidney, we'll perfuse it with cryoprotectants, wash them out, transplant the kidney for one or two hours or one or two days and drop in liquid nitrogen. And what we then do is we grind that kidney up and we measure every protein and every transcript and every metabolite that we can measure in that whole kidney. And what that's going to result in is a signature of cryoprotectant related damage. And what that's going to do is tell us for the first time, you know, uh, where uh, injury is coming from, both uh, as a direct result of exposure to cryoprotective agents and uh, as a result of putting that kidney back into a challenging environment, namely a real body at 37 degrees when you have to restore metabolism and you have to not have blood clots form in your blood vessels and all kinds of things like that. And what we're going to learn as a result of that is that we've already begun to do this. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about this. Uh, what we're going to learn is what goes wrong and therefore what we can do to fix it. So for example, um, there are things called heat shock proteins, which prevent proteins from being denatured, or in certain cases can uh, renature a protein that has been denatured. So protein denature, you know about proteins, uh, but proteins in order to work, they have to be in a certain shape. And uh, the shape is dictated by their interaction with water in their surroundings. And if you replace 70% of the water with some alien chemical that the protein never had any uh, preparation for, it may unfold, it may change its shape and it may not work anymore. But what if you rev up uh, chaperones uh, uh, before you expose these things to cryoprotective agents? The chaperones stabilize the shape of the protein so that even though you now remove the water, the protein is preserved. And then when you, you know, put the, the kidney back in, uh, the proteins are there and the kidney does much better. So we've already developed some collaborative evidence that that sort of thing works under the right circumstances. We've also done some interesting experiments with forward genetics. So to answer your question, you know, artificial intelligence can look through a lot more data than I can, right? If I have, you know, 5,000 transcripts changing and I've got a thousand metabolites changing and I've got, you know, a lot of proteins, you know, uh, changing their abundance or whatever, how am I gonna make sense out of that? There are people that have programs that will say, okay, well, this pathway is affected, that pathway is affected, all of that's nice. But if we had an even higher level of intelligence to supervise that data, it might say, oh, well, the reason that this pathway changed is because that other pathway changed in exactly this way. And that's why this metabolite changed and that's why that transcript changed, you know, and put it all together, right? This is beyond our capability right now or pretty much uh, beyond it. But you know, AI can help us sort this sort of stuff out. Uh, I was just gonna mention this other NEATO experiment that we actually got an award for. Uh, we published it uh, in 2019. It's a forward genetics. So um, the approach I just described to you is kind of a blunderbuss approach. So you treat the cell with a cryoprotective agent and then you look at everything that changes and you try to sort out you know, what happened. So you may see, oh, this protein went up, is that, a cause of the problem or is that an effect of the problem? Is that a pathological change or is that a change that actually helps? That's a compensatory change. It's really hard to sort that out. That's where AI could be helpful. But there's a direct way in which you can find out exactly whether a given protein is important or not. And that is you can knock it out. So um, we did this experiment with embryonic stem cells. You generate 30,000 independent mutations of embryonic stem cells. So you have this dish of embryonic stem cells with millions of stem cells, and there's 30,000 mutations, all different, and only one mutation per cell in that dish. 
So now you take that dish and you expose it to M22, which is the vitrification solution that we use in my lab to preserve kidneys, and you kill off 99.9% .9 of the cells. And then you find out who survived, which mutants survived, and where are those mutations in the genome? Because we use this, this technique that allows you to go back and find out which gene was actually mutated. And then this technique allows you to pop that mutagen out of the genome and restore the function of that gene. So you can there then see, okay, without that mutation now, the susceptibility to M22 is, has returned. Uh, and, and when we knock that gene out, the susceptibility goes away. So we know for a fact that that gene somehow contributes to the damage seen by M22, you know, caused by M22. So now we say, okay, well that gene can be drugged by this chemotherapeutic agent or this you know, penicillin derivative or whatever it is. Let's try that. And if, if we use that, there have been experiments done that show that cells can survive better after treatment with a drug that simulates one of these protective mutations. So that's tremendously exciting also. Uh, and uh, it may be another thing that would help you know, your artificial intelligence sort of decipher what that gene means and why that's an important change and uh, maybe even help us design a drug to inhibit a particular pathway that we don't have a drug to inhibit yet. So there's all kinds of ways, you know, and as you know, Alex Zavaronkov has used artificial intelligence to do drug development. So, you know, once we know which drugs we need, you know, then we may be able to actually go out and, and start making them. And that could revolutionize cryobiology. So we have a lot of different ways of revolutionizing cryobiology. It's really a very exciting time in the field. It's just that almost nobody is pursuing any of these approaches. So we're doing it to the extent that we can uh, on a pretty limited budget, but that at least we see the vision and, and we're dancing it as we're able. Very nice. It's, and I've talked to like Alex that. about helping us with this, but I never really got a straight answer out of him. So maybe, maybe I'll have that conversation again. Yeah. Um, so we're at the end of the official time. I'm not sure if you have any, if you need to go somewhere or do something else. Uh, I can hang out a little bit longer. You know, we'll have to wrap it up okay. after a while, but yeah, I can go a little bit longer. So that's fine. Okay. So is there anybody else in the chat who has more questions for Dr. Fahey? Um, I was actually really curious, what, what has it been like communicating your research to the public? Like, are they, you know, is it well received? Is it just kind of glossed over? Um, <laughs> I, I, the only public I've really uh, discussed uh, my research with uh, uh, has been uh, at RADFEST conferences, really. I mean, uh, I, I gave another talk recently, but I think I didn't realize that the audience was lay. I thought it was a scientific audience, so I think I uh, didn't aim the talk uh, at the right uh, position uh, in that case. But uh, at RADFEST, uh, I know what I'm dealing with. I know I'm dealing mostly with lay people, and I try to make it comprehensible and so far people have been pretty enthusiastic about it uh so i've been pretty successful at conveying it to, to that extent but mostly i talk about the aging work uh at uh, scientific meetings and things like that although you know I, to tell you the truth i've been doing a lot of these interviews lately as well and uh generally speaking that that goes pretty well as well so i think people understand it um I think there are two kinds of people. There are people that care and people that don't care. And, uh, you know, believe it or not, there's a lot of people that just are not interested in their own aging process or what it's going to do to them eventually. I think uh, as humans, we like to just ignore unpleasantness. And so we don't think about these things until we need to order our first wheelchair or whatever. But uh, those of us who can see into the future and understand that aging is going to get us eventually, uh, and start paying attention, uh, those kinds of audiences uh, are very receptive to what I've been saying, and, and I really appreciate their ability to uh, comprehend the significance of what we're trying to accomplish. We have a question from Michael first, and then from Dan. Um, yeah. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, first, I apologize if this has been asked. I was not able to get on uh, early, although I tried very hard. But and, and I'll be quick. Let me first say thank you very much, Greg Fahey. Um, it is phenomenal the work that you and some others are doing, and the fact that you are accessible 
um, uh, to people who aren't uh, immediate colleagues uh, or necessarily in the field. And I, for one, am uh, tremendously appreciative. Uh, number two, I find your work Thank to you. be um, thrilling and exciting. You uh, used a phrase uh, just a few moments ago, uh, not your uh, father's aging. I am uh, about to turn 59. Um, I was uh, originally um, uh, an organic chemist. Uh, I had to get out of that because it wasn't enough money to feed my family. But um, I follow the um, uh, anti-aging and longevity um, uh, field uh, as closely as I can and do the things that I can do to uh, hopefully preserve myself to the point where some of these interventions become available uh, before I get too old for too much damage to accumulate. And along those lines, and here's the apology if this was already asked and answered earlier, your um, thymus trial, um, is any parts of that cocktail available to us lay people in any manner um, now? And thank you again. Yeah, so the answer is sort of yes and no. So. Yes, you can find the components, although they're not very accessible um, uh, uh, in the sense that uh, your doctor may be reluctant to prescribe growth hormone for you uh, because the FDA doesn't like that to be prescribed for anything other than adult growth hormone deficiency, which affects almost nobody, and short children, which are few in number as well. Uh, but the second part of it is that um, as I said earlier in my presentation or in the discussion, uh, I don't really think that you should try it, right? Because uh, there are too many things that can go wrong. Uh, it, it sounds simple and easy, but it's just really, really complicated. When I was uh, recruiting people early stages for our current trial, TrimX, which is still recruiting now, uh, you know, people who were applying to enter the trial had every kind of medical condition imaginable, and uh, every kind of uh, complication uh, potential imaginable. And, uh, you know, if they just tried doing this treatment uh, on their own without knowing anything about what they're doing, uh, they could actually get themselves into trouble. So um, you are so young, Michael, really. I mean, I have to tell you, you're a young man right now. Uh, you can wait. <laughs> I, I <laughs> hope you're right. You are a young man. And, you know, in, and in trim, I have to tell you, in trim, you know, we had guys anywhere from 50, uh, 51 really, to uh, 65 entering the trial. And the benefits had no relationship to what their age was when they entered the trial. So Saw that. Yeah, so you're, you're a spring chicken. You know, you, uh, you got at least uh, six years to go before you'd even have a question about whether you might benefit from it. Six years from now, maybe you can just go to your doctor and say, hey, doc, I need a thymus uh, recharge. And... Uh, They'll say, okay, fine, you know, we'll order a, a, a trim battery for you. And, uh, you know, a year, year and a half from now, you'll be as good as new. Uh, so you can afford to wait. Let us debug it. Uh, let us figure out how to make it as maximally safe as possible and, uh, and how to instruct your doctor as to what to pay attention when he's evaluating you for the treatment. So when he says, okay, Michael, let's go for this, he knows what he's talking about. Thank you very, very much. You're very, very welcome. All right, uh, Dan, can you use your microphone or did you want um, someone else to ask your question from? Yeah, hi, I can use the microphone. Uh, so um, this has been a development, uh, an old development. Uh, there are uh, Petri dishes of neural cultures that have been uh, taught various uh, simple skills such as a uh, fly a flight simulator using inputs and outputs. I was wondering if, um, uh, what the value would be in uh, trying to cryopreserve those and then uh, rewarm them and see to what extent their uh, neural function is preserved? Because I feel it to be a proxy to human brain uh, preservation. Well, um, there's a number of uh, ways of addressing that question. So one one way is that uh, most uh, neuronal systems and culture can be cryopreserved pretty well. Uh, so I don't think that would be difficult to achieve. Um, synapses stand up very well to freezing and thawing, even under poor condition. So any synaptic restructuring that's been involved in the learning process should be preserved. 
and by the way, though, that would be a great model, right? Because one of the issues with brain preservation is preservation of memory, whether that happens or not. So you had Natasha Vitamore, uh, you know, uh, crowd preserve some C. elegans and then show that they could respond behaviorally in the same way after they were either frozen or vitrified compared to, you know, uh, control worms. But that C. elegans, and what does that mean? And is it really uh, memory or is that just imprinting of an odor response or whatever? So, um, uh, you know, if you had a synaptic model in a dish, that had actually been trained to give some certain outputs in response to an input, and you crowd preserve that and showed that same response was preserved, I think that would be excellent evidence that mechanisms of memory uh, can be actually crowd preserved. So that, that would be nice. Uh, and so my question was, uh, given how um, important this would be uh, as proof of crowd preservation, how come it hasn't been done? Because this experiment with the neural network uh, was done, I believe, uh, in 2005. Right. So the answer to that question is the answer to many questions that are like that. And it's a disappointing answer, but it's the truth. It's the reality of life, right? The answer is nobody cares, right? Nobody cares. <laughs> nobody, nobody cares about brain crowd preservation. Nobody cares about demonstrating that, that thing. So the only, you know, almost nobody, let's put it that way, almost nobody. So we have a few people trickling into the field now that are doing things like crowd preserving retinas, you know, uh, and that's a pretty complicated neural structure. Uh, and they're doing that not only because retinal transplants might cure blindness, but also it provides evidence that complex neuronal systems can be crowd preserved. And we already showed that uh, in hippocampal slices, uh, you know, an adult rat, we were able to vitrify adult rat hippocampal slices and warm them back up and show that their ultrastructure would look great and their viability was essentially perfect, unchanged from just you know treatment with crowd protectants. And then we graduated that from rats to adult rabbits, and we took their hippocampal slices and we vitrified them and we warmed them up and showed that not only were they perfectly viable, uh, but also if we stimulated them with an electrode and we measured uh, an induced response elsewhere in the hippocampal circuit, that the response was indistinguishable from control and that the LTP response, which is the ability of the system to learn, was unaffected as well. And it was unaffected after long-term storage as well. So that's an even more sophisticated model than your, than your neuronal dish model, but it has a disadvantage of not teaching us anything about any specific memory. We showed that the, that the machinery underlying memory can be preserved, but we didn't actually show memory can be preserved. And one problem that we have with that is that if you stick an electrode into something and then you expose it to crowd protectant uh, and, and then warm it back up again, and you vitrify it and you warm it back up again, that uh, electrode is going to move and it's not going to be in the same position that it was before. So you can't really uh, retrace that same memory that you were, or component of memory that you were looking at before. But in your dish, you could do that. But, you know, nobody cares, you know, in the neurobiology community, you know, you have Society for Neuroscience, you know, 30,000 people will show up for the Society for Neuroscience meeting. Not a single one of them has ever thought of doing that experiment because none of them care. Uh, you have artificial intelligence meetings and, you know, they're looking at everything that you can think of, but nobody's thinking about preserving uh, brain uh, functions. So it's going to take somebody like you, Dan, to sort of uh, stimulate somebody to do that experiment, I think. I was hoping that uh, 21st century medicine would uh, care. I, uh, I have the well, idea. But... We, we would care. It's just a matter of bandwidth. Um, so actually, we've been thinking recently about uh, getting, seeking some grant money so we can do more than we otherwise could do. Uh, maybe this is a topic that we could take up. So we, we might want to have a conversation about this. So Dan, if, if you want to write me about this model and, and give me more information about it, maybe we could actually do, do that research. I think we might be able to do that without uh, an infinite amount of effort and, and, and trouble and pain, uh, but we'd have to understand the system better than I do right now. So, you know, my email address is gfahy at the number 21 and then cm.com, 21cm.com. Uh, if you want to write to me and, and uh, you know, bring up this sub subject, maybe we could actually get an experiment out of it, which would be an unusual benefit from just giving an interview, you know, on the internet. So. 
Uh, thanks for bringing up the concept. Thank you so much, Dr. My pleasure. Awesome. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Um, anybody else have any questions right before? I think we're probably at the tail end of um, I, I, this interview. I think I have one last question. Um, it seems like, you know, repeatedly through the, at these interviews, it seems like a lot of people seem to feel that their research is a little bit limited by policy making or whether it's being, it's able to kind of push past the FDA or bureaucratic processes. Yeah. I guess maybe I'm asking like what, would it take to, you know, push forward the research, I suppose, or what, what do they require for, you know, any of these to work? Right. So um, there's, so there's, there's two levels of concern. One is the research level showing that it works. And then the other is the bureaucrat level, which is being allowed to bring it to people to benefit them. Right. And, uh, I think on the research level, we're okay within reason. It's, it's the regulatory level that's a problem. So um, uh, I think uh, we need to uh, rethink how we use certain things. So uh, there has been a proposal that's been floating around for a while. Uh, <clears throat> I, I know Mike West was one of the proponents of it. George Church seems to like the idea. Um, it's problematic because uh, people who regulate things like to regulate things and they have power by regulating things. And if you ask them to give up power, they, they, re they are reluctant to do that. But if you think about why we have an FDA, okay, why do we have an FDA? We have an FDA basically because the thalidomide came out and caused a lot of, uh, or maybe diethylstilbestrol, I'll have to review the history there. Uh, and it caused a lot of birth defects. And, um, uh, and so we decided we needed to have a, a regulatory body to make sure that people weren't harmed by drugs. Uh, but then we went, first of all, uh, the FDA has not actually prevented that sort of thing from happening. But beyond that, uh, we went beyond that original goal of protecting people to making sure that people didn't waste their money and uh, by, by buying drugs that, that didn't work, right? So now you have to prove not only safety, but efficacy. So the idea is why does the government care how I spend my money? I should be able to waste my money any way that I want, right? I should be able to have expensive urine by taking a lot of vitamin C that maybe doesn't do me any good if that's what I want. It's nobody else's business how I spend my money. So why don't we trim the FDA back from efficacy and safety to just safety alone? And if the drug is released and it has no efficacy, nobody's going to buy it, so it won't matter. Uh, but if it, it, if it does work, uh, then uh, uh, it will catch on and uh, people will benefit from it five or 10 years sooner. So a lot of people's lives will be saved and a lot of uh, suffering will be avoided. So that, that would be one way of, of addressing it. Okay, just feel uh, policy pushing policies where it has been kind of a, you know, under, under, uh, under focused area. Um, yeah. Because it, yeah. it wasn't just you who had it brought up like, oh, hey, this has been really limiting my research. There were quite a few other people who mentioned quite the same thing. I'm very um, you know, heartened to hear that because I think the reflex is always to want to control things more and more and more. And unfortunately, the more you squeeze people, the less they can do, you know, the, 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 the less they can breathe, the less freedom they have to operate and actually do what we all want done. So uh, I'm glad that that, that, that was uh, expressed before. Okay. All right, well, thank you. It's been fun. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I sense that uh, people got some questions answered. So uh, thank you and uh, good day to everybody and uh, happy non-aging. Yep, thank you for being here and uh... You're just really awesome. So Thanks a lot. Good, good to hear from you. And uh, all, right. all right. I think that's, uh, that's about it for today. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.